the pleasure of introducing our first guest speaker today, uh, Professor Christopher Luke of the University of Tasmania in Australia. I'm very happy because he is a former PhD student of mine, and of course because he has been uh, brainwashed at our laboratory, he has included considerations of embodiment into his research agenda, and today he will talk about embodiment and scaffolding in human computer interaction. Christopher, the floor is yours, and thank you for coming. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, you mentioned already, um, I have been kind of brainwashed, and uh, um, what I'm going to talk about is basically an example of what happens if you have been brainwashed, and then you look into other areas that are um, related to uh, cognitive science and artificial intelligence, but uh, at different application areas. And uh, I'm particularly interested in human computer interaction. That's what I'm teaching at the university here. And um, information behavior, which there's a whole literature on that. And uh, I'm having going to have a very quick look at that. And uh, I can certainly say that the exposure to the, um, the, let's say, the Shanghai thinking has shaped the way I look at information behavior. And uh, that means that I look at that from a fairly different point of view than a lot of people in that field, which is uh, very much driven by library and information science. Just to mention for some people who are not familiar with um, Tasmania, we are not Transylvania in Europe, and we are also not um, in Africa. So we are actually um, part of uh, um, Australia at the southeast corner. Sometimes um, that gets confused. So this is a very quick outline. And uh, so I'm talking a little bit about information behavior and so aspects of that and what made me think about certain aspects in studying information behavior that uh, don't really work out if you look at it from a perspective that includes embodiment and uh, certain, uh, let's say, cognitive characteristics of human beings. And uh, then I'm looking at how that affects how we could study information behavior and also how we can use certain aspects for designing interfaces. So I already have this little asterisk up there to make very clear that when I talk about information behavior, I'm talking about behavior in a very broad sense. So general inter uh, interaction with information and uh, people who listen to the Shanghai lectures, they might ask themselves at some point, I'm not going to ask that right now, is there any kind of situation where we do not engage with information? So is there a point distinguishing between, let's say, information behavior and information seeking and information actions or something like that and other types of behavior? And uh, I think the fact that uh, I listed that as a four question or um, as a trick question uh, that might point people to um, the fact that I see it in a slightly different way. So I'm not trying to distinguish between those. If you do the same thing at an information science conference or library information science conference, you probably get roasted by um, and, and um, chased by the audience because they use information behavior in a very, very specific way. And um, yeah, I don't agree. So if you have um, accepted that the mind, and uh, I think in, in this lecture we do that, that the mind is embodied and not just embrained, then the question is, how does that influence the way we look at information behavior? So is there something, can we really separate between certain information actions and uh, other types of actions? Does it make sense to distinguish between these different types of actions? And um, there's a lot of different theories in um, information behavior in the literature. Usually, they are fairly high-level uh, descriptions, and uh, they, they look at uh, different types of behaviors and um, different phases in different um, behavior and, and so on. And there's, um, we will see that in the Shanghai lectures, there are lots of problems with trying to distinguish between certain aspects of behavior or categorizing certain behaviors. So heaps of problems in there. I just want to point out that often 
when we talk about information behavior, information interaction, we tend to think of stuff like um, um, web forums, Usenet discussions, Google, Twitter, um, down here in the corner, I've got a TV set, so um, lots of information that comes on screens, TV, and so on, Facebook. That comes to mind when we um, think of interacting with information. And what I and a lot of um, work in um, library information science is focused on those types of information. I should have um, 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 included a few books as well. Now, what I'm very interested in is this, and uh, that is a an airport um, somewhere. I don't actually know where. I didn't take the picture. What I find interesting about the picture is not the fact that you see all these screens up there or that there's other types of information. What I find particularly interesting is that if you don't look into the right direction, you're not going to see that information. And if you know the, the experience of being at an airport and you try to find the, the departure gate or you try to find the departure information, if you do not look into the right direction and you don't have the right distance between a display and uh, your body, and you don't orient your, uh, your body in a way that you can see that information, you are going to face problems. So the question is, that aspect of embodiment that basically mediates between the information that we can even perceive in a, in a um, physiological way and the information that we can access and what we do with our body, how can we find a relationship between that? And that kind of um, um, interaction with the environment is something that is very uh, prominent in the Shanghai lectures, but it's not very prominent. Um, I would say it's barely um, there in the information behavior literature, where it's very, very rare that someone says, aha, I did not just look at the information that people used in order to solve a problem. I also looked at the information that they did not use, and I also looked at the information that the problem solver actually missed. So they couldn't actually use it. Now, I'm going to use a couple of examples from the information behavior literature. And uh, just to point out that embodiment is something that comes up and you can't actually avoid it. That's the nice thing. So um, there's the um, embodiment is always there as, as an issue. Um, and we need to be careful when testing models. And uh, my argument is also that there's always more than embodiment. There's always something that uh, um, comes up. And this one, I really love that. It's from 2004. And uh, um, Sandra Adelest from University of Missouri, I think she was really forward-looking and uh, um, uh, innovative when using eye-tracking technology to look at certain information behaviors. And she told, um, investigated noticing which is the idea that um, you're exposed to information like a search engine, and then there's other types of information. And she tried to find out whether, like measure whether people notice that information and find a way to quantify that. So they were doing lots of um, experiments. The interesting thing that I want to point out is that initially they called noticing that is not followed by stopping, like stop, and uh, examining, like examining that other information. Um, noticing that's not followed is an exclusively cognitive activity. So it's just thinking, you know. Um, you don't need a body for that, it's just thinking. And just one or two sentences later, um, they say, aha, they, they use eye tracking technology. So obviously the body is involved and you can't actually find out without tracking attention and the eyes and the way we look at things obviously have a very important role in there because you can track aspects of the body, namely the eyes, in order to find out what's happening. There's a certain correlation between um, what our gaze is directed to and uh, um, what people do. The other example is from a paper where um, uh, Lydia Baker looked at undercover work by female police officers uh, in undercover um, prostitution work. And uh, she observed um, these um, decoys. And uh, one of the things that she points out in her paper is that, um, so it was outdoors and uh, um, out in town. Headlights from 
oncoming cars blocked the vision of the eye. So the eye is a person with whom she was parked on the side um, straight. However, the eye parked on Main Street had the decoy in um, their view. Now, there's something about observing the situation and so on. And what I found particularly interesting is that it's about embodiment. And it's about the fact that sometimes the vision is blocked and sometimes you don't see information, that that information is actually very important in order to evaluate the situation and also to understand information behavior. So there's something that is very intrinsically linked between what we call information behavior and the body and our perception and the way we can actually um, interact with information. And the fact that the interaction with information is mediated by the way we perceive our environment. And uh, so if you think back of this little uh, picture, then I hope that you can clearly see what I try to get at with that uh, picture. And the interesting thing is once you start to look for examples, then suddenly there's examples almost everywhere. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting perception issue in itself that examples that you're looking for are there once you start looking for them. So there's something that, um, about uh, human perception that we need to pay more attention to. And I just want to mention very briefly a few things. Some of that comes up in the Shanghai lectures. Um, some of them don't. About perception, about attention, what we pay attention to, and something that uh, uh, is still... I think there's more to explore in action. And if you look um, at the Pfeiffer and Bongard book, they describe in a little section that the way we interact with the environment changes the way how we perceive information. We also had a reference earlier with uh, computer vision. And there's a thing about the body that we can use for changing the way we perceive information and uh, the kind of information that we see. This is, I'm not going to show the video, but uh, a lot of people are familiar with this um, gorilla video and uh, the fact that what it demonstrates is if we concentrate very hard on something, we miss a lot of other things. And one of the lessons is that we always miss a lot of things. We can't, that's a perception thing, we can't perceive, we don't have a per complete model of the world. We always see and perceive certain aspects of the world. And um, so... How can we work that into information behavior models if we don't actually know what information a person saw? Because there's, um, if we ask them, well, then we are facing uh, post hoc rationalizations and limited introspection and so on. So this is about the, the gorilla people. Something like 50% of people don't recognize a gorilla that is walking through a scene when people concentrate on counting the number of um, um, passes the number of passes between um, players that are wearing a T-shirt of a particular color. It's 50% of people miss out on seeing that gorilla. And uh, there's a book that I highly can um, recommend very highly on the invisible gorilla. There's similar um, things in other areas. Um, Rosenblum wrote a book on and it explains that uh, often what we hear is influenced what, by what we see. So there's a certain overlap between senses and uh, um, there are experiments that show that our mind basically um, sometimes overrules sensory information, which is um, very exciting. If you think, well, missing information, you know, yeah, that can happen. I mean, this is one of the, the most bizarre examples that I came across when I was looking for um, inattentional blindness, that's the term. And uh, so in the, in the Gulf, there was a coalition between a U.S. Um, guided missile destroyer and an oil tanker. Now, you would think that these huge ships, and they are fairly slowly moving, that how on earth can it happen that these two ships collide? I mean, the, the crews on those ships would have all kinds of electronic gear available to see where the other ships are. It's not rapid movement. It doesn't happen within a few seconds. It's... Um, it's absolutely fascinating that that happened. And uh, one of my personal experiences, which is a very nice example of um, information behavior and uh, how perception can interfere with that kind of behavior, is I took this picture in a bookshop where I was looking for the book, The Brain That Changes Itself. It's on the plastic brain. And I knew how the book looks like. 
I knew the author. I was standing there. I was scanning the bookshelf, and I did not find the book. So I was standing there for five minutes. I was looking for the book. I went to the help desk and asked for the book. And the book is... I had a red circle there that's uh, vanished. Here's the book. Here. The whole time it was just in front of me, and I knew how it looks like, and I did not see that book. So if you transfer that into a, an area where it's about document management, for example, if you ask people, ah, what are the, the important documents, you would basically have to ask them, well, which books did you not see? Because otherwise, you, you can't actually make, a, uh, make sense of that uh, behavior. So what does that mean? Where, where do we go from there? And uh, one of the challenges is that um, this uh, fairly famous what we know, what we don't know. Unfortunately, if you look at uh, information behaviors, we don't know what we don't know. And uh, um, we would know and need that kind of information for um, making sense of information behavior. From there, we can basically go forward by saying, well, let's try to see if we can take information behavior models and find some grounding for them and ground these uh, models in perception and say, that's how these uh, models and actual perception be uh, belong together. It's extremely complicated, and I, um, I suspect that uh, a part of the Shanghai lectures are going to talk about that. And I got, have a couple of quotes here. Um, it's very, very uh, complicated. Science of cognition requires studying cognitive process, specific environments, think, reason, and act, um, how cognition enters into and is part of the diverse set of tasks, and so on. It's very, very complicated. This is eye tracking technology. I would love to use that. And I think uh, at some point, eye tracking and gaze tracking technology will help us better understand information behavior. But there's a, um, quite a fair bit to go. Another point, well, the question is, is that actually necessary in behave, information behavior? Most people probably say no. We stick to our, um, our descriptive models. I'm very interested in doing that. And uh, one thing is, of course, even if you track the gaze, if you look at something, it doesn't mean that you really recognize that information. So there's a, there's a certain limit that you hit even when you are look, um, using eye tracking and gaze um, tracking technology. The other thing is that we can look for um, um, augmenting the environment. For example, adding cues using um, virtual reality technology, mixed reality technology, little gadgets to add cues to the environment and help people recognize certain things that they would miss otherwise. There's, of course, a problem that in order to model that, we need to know roughly what they might miss. And um, again, we have got the challenge that uh, um, sometimes you look at something and you still don't recognize it. So it's, it's almost like a, um, um, like a circle that you can't escape. Something else is um, about scaffolding minds and to have um, interfaces that serve the scaffolding mind, which is basically saying, well, a lot of cognition happens because we are structuring complex tasks into very, very simple tasks. And uh, so the mind works by restructuring and using the, the environment to restructure um, complex tasks, and then we focus on smaller things. In computing, we call that uh, divide and conquer. That's the computational approach. But uh, the argument that was uh, put forward by Andy Clark in um, was that uh, the human mind works a, like a, um, uh, is a scaffolding mind. There are lots of examples how we outsource information. We use um, external memory, desk layout, um, post-it notes, and so on. Um, in, the, um, in the book for the course, there's an example on road signs that we are structuring the way we are um, searching um, a route or a path um, is helped and eased by placing road signs. So basically, rather than thinking about the whole route, we only do, which would be the very complex task, we only look at the signs and we can match, aha, that's the sign, that's the sign, we're still following the sign, and so on. So it would be um, reduction into, of a very complex task into much simpler tasks. And uh, so I've got a few examples here where I reinterpret information interaction as if it is done by a scaffolding mind. And if you think of something like... Um, Google, you will find that even if you look at gaze tracking data, 
that uh, what people roughly do is they look at the first one and then they look at the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. So you could interpret that, and there's a very strong frame of reference problem in there that I'm going to mention. Um, just, you know, um, it's a theme in the, thesis, in, the, in the lecture. But a, a, sequ a sequential working on the information that comes back. We don't take this whole picture, but we're looking at, aha, is it the first one, is it the next one, is it the next one? And uh, you could argue that that suits the scaffolding mind. That's uh, similar from uh, a web form or from Usenet. Um, here's um, an application where the scaffolding would basically say, aha, this is the rating of a hotel is scaffolded such that the decision making is very, very simple. So it's just about a number of stars. It's not a complex task. It's very, very reduced. And it's uh, the, um, the task of, evalu of providing an um, evaluation is broken down into a series of very, very simple steps, which, according to my, um, or the argument that I put forward, is that uh, um, it suits the scaffolding mind. And um, some years back, a lot of years back, it's a vintage project, we actually had a very complex decision-making situation. And the only thing that I mention here is that in the end, what, one of the things that we came up with was a um, very nice example of um, an ambient formation display and uh, where making very complex decisions about, um, about energy and uh, using uh, certain types of energy was broken down to using different types of lights that would indicate, aha, uh -huh, we have plenty of energy, um, we have normal energy status, and uh, please, please be very, very careful um, with the amount of energy that you are using. So a very complex decision-making situation for operators of a paper production line was scaffolded according to a number of very simple lights. And uh, maybe at some point we have got more time to um, really look into that uh, um, study, which was very, very interesting, it was done in Switzerland. So. The conclusions are that uh, um, there's a crucial role of embodiment intelligent behavior, and I think that uh, all people, or most people um, attending this class are probably sharing that perspective, but uh, from other discussions, I can certainly say that uh, there are also a lot of people who think that, ah, um, yeah, it's kind of trivial that we have a body, so what? And uh, so... The, the perspective that the fact that we have a body changes everything. Well, Apple claims the same, but it actually changes everything. If you, if you use an embodied perspective, it changes everything. It changes the way how you look at things. And um, I'm very excited about there's a surge in research exploring perception action in the real world, including using eye tracking in the real world and uh, correlating uh, behaviors and gaze and so on. Very exciting area. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are um, going to be very interesting um, outcomes. There's an opportunity for designing interfaces, having scaffolding minds in the back of your mind. So I think that uh, um, a lot of the design guidelines that we say actually pay attention to or, or honor the fact that we have scaffolding minds without ever mentioning that. And I talked to a whole bunch of people who are involved in human-computer interaction, in interaction design, and so on. And uh, uh, hardly any person is aware of this um, concept of scaffolding minds. So there's something um, coming up. And uh, I think there's also a lot of opportunities for rethinking and uh, reconceptualizing how we perceive information behavior, how we study information behavior. And there's also scope for questioning a lot of the models that we have in information behavior. And uh, that's the slide one before last. The fact that I used an example from the mid-90s, or uh, um, yeah, mid-late um, 90s, the Swiss paper mill, is an indication that uh, it's a topic that I'm interested in for a very, very long time. And uh, just um, recently, there was a surge in new papers, especially about gaze tracking and some of the findings around there, so that I got back to that topic to look into that in more detail. And uh, so I find this uh, um, quote by artist Uta Bart, who's a photographer, very, very interesting learning, that what I aim for in my work today 
was present long before I could name it. And that's it, and uh, that's my presentation. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher, for a really fascinating uh, presentation. I mean, I'm really, of course, very excited um, about the fact that the perspective of embodiment gives you an entirely new way of approaching this problem of studying information behavior and that there's a lot of, and what's also interesting and I think that fits very well with what we said before is the issue is always in the interaction with the real world you know it's yep. kind of not the internal stuff that's going on but it's the interaction with the real world gaze where where I gaze where I look is you know where I basically generate the information you know that I'm going to process so thank you very much I think that fits very much, it sort of underlies, corroborates the hypothesis of the importance of embodiment, even in seemingly disembodied activities like information behavior. Exactly. Okay. Well, very yeah. good. So I would like to open the discussion now to the uh, entire, by the way, I just should mention Christopher showed you, he is completely on the other side of the globe. So, I mean, you can hardly be, New Zealand would be a little more even on the other side, but... A little know, bit, a little bit, yeah. A little bit, right. So, we can, we can now directly interact with the entire globe. So, please, uh, if you have questions from the um, virtual, global virtual lecture hall, that's the opportunity to uh, Christopher. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, is uh, scaffolding an uh, extended phenotype uh, in terms of uh, uh, Richard Dawkins or not? <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, there would be the question about the genetic basis for scaffolding. Almost. I, uh... I, I, I suspect I would have to get back to you and uh, um, have to think about that. I can't answer that straight away. I, I suspect yes. yes. But, uh, so, um, so, is it possible? Certainly, I, I don't. Would it be possible to briefly explain in one or two sentences what the extended phenotype by Richard Dawkins actually means? Could you do that just very briefly, uh, Moscow? <laughs> uh, otherwise, we could use that in a, the next lecture. Five minutes in the uh, le next lecture. Okay, let's do Is that. Let's do that. Okay, let's let's do that. Maybe you, we can have some offline uh, information behavior uh, to deal <laughs> with this uh, issue and come back uh, to the problem next week. Yeah. So, do we have other statements or comments? or questions to Christopher uh, on uh, information behavior, gaze tracking behavior. Points here. Somewhere, so please just state the name of your university and then uh, So, I mean, uh, Christopher, maybe I can ask a question. So, there's, I mean, information science, you know, is a really big field. Uh, so, do you expect, like, a fundamental sort of paradigm shift uh, in the uh, next few years with all these studies? You mentioned that there has been a surge of studies on gaze tracking in information behavior. So, is this going to change the field of human-computer or human-machine interaction in fundamental ways? I do think so, yes. 
And I think that uh, um, the, the fact that we are approaching the state where we can do very uh, precise gaze tracking in natural environments, that it's going to give us a lot of new information for re-evaluating the models that we have and uh, for creating new models. I think it's also going to um, bring us to the interesting situation that we will see where we are going to hit the wall with gaze tracking. Because while the precise tracking of the gaze can tell us what we look at, it's still not telling us what we perceive. And uh, so there's very, very interesting research that shows that um, on the one hand, we, it's, there are situations where we look at something that is directly in front of us and we don't see it. And uh, the gorilla is an example where people, the, the gaze tracking would actually confirm that people were looking at the gorilla, but they didn't perceive the gorilla or um, they didn't consciously perceive and process the gorilla. There's also research that shows that in a lot of cases, we think we see information that was not actually there. And uh, there were experiments in, uh, I think it was the Netherlands, where they worked with magicians. And uh, um, there's a very interesting um, video on the web that I could dig up where they show that uh, there was a, a magical trick. And they could show that uh, the expectation of the person watching that uh, magician was overriding what the person actually saw. So they were doing some eye tracking and they could see that, or they could um, demonstrate that the eyes were basically not tricked by the magician. They, so the eyes did not look into a certain direction that the person thought they, what they had been looking at. It was a, a, a trick about um, throwing balls and uh, the expectation but what people expect is so strong that often we see information that is not actually there. So there will be some stage where we use right. eye, tra eye tracking and gaze tracking yeah. where we hit the wall because it shows us very limited information about right. how the internal processing of that information actually yeah. happens. Exactly. Yeah, and that, I think that's a very important point. There is an additional, oops, there is an additional point and that it's gaze tracking is only about vision. So it's not about other exactly. sensory modalities, and we you know, can acquire a lot of information with our touch, sense of touch, uh, in addition. So that we may, and we can manipulate objects also, also for the visual system, right? So I think there is a huge research Hello. field uh, coming up. So thank you very much, Christopher. I think... Uh, Hello. The, Hello? Yes, ah, we have a question, Hello? yes. Rolf, Rolf Samia from Salford. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I just have a question. I'm not sure if you are. I just have a question. Thank you very much for the excellent talk and the subject as well. I, I really think that uh, information science will will get something out of, out of the the concept of embodiment. I could see really the uh, there is a, a big big uh, research which will go in this area. I mean, you mentioned the the question I have is you mentioned that the eye tracking could be a very important asset for information behavior. Would you go as far as say, extend that to other cues, other senses? Because we know the context is important as well. The eye, but you have other cues which could be important as well for studying yes. information behavior. And what do you think on this? And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, like we, just, uh, we have a storm down here, so it feels like um, when I get distracted, that's because it, it sounds like uh, um, the whole university is going to be ripped apart very soon. So it's a little storm down here. The, the question about uh, other modalities, yes. I mean, um, gaze tracking, um, as, as Rolf pointed out, gaze tracking is about vision. And uh, there's um, a lot of other ways how we experience the environment, how we change the environment through embodied action. There's also um, a lot of um, work that has been done uh, about the different ways of how we perceive information, how we value information, how we attribute um, uh, importance to certain documents, 
to what extent that is um, shaped by our knowledge, um, to what extent that is shaped by our expectations, and so on, our level of education. So it's a very, very broad field where lots of different things come together. And I think that uh, um, the embodiment perspective and uh, um, looking more closely how the body interacts with information is adding to that um, uh, field. Uh, once again, thanks for a really inspiring lecture and thanks to the audience for the questions and the discussion.